Welcome to this Beyond Zero e-learning catch-up module on the management of TB and HIV co-infection. This is the second part um, of this session that's going to focus on HIV and TB co-infection. And we'll be focusing in this module on the management of TB HIV co-infection, specifically around the timing and choice of art, um, looking a little bit at drug interactions, the monitoring, and, and iris. Um, and in the first module, we started a case with a lady called Dinio, who was gene expert negative, um, and we had started on empiric TB treatment, um, and that module covers that case approach in some detail. So we're starting her on TB treatment today, and a CD4 count at the moment is 320 cells. So we now have to decide how soon we are going to start on ARVs. Are we going to start it today on the same day as the TB treatment? Are we going to start her after six months once she's completed her TB treatment? Are we going to do it as soon as she's tolerating her TB treatment? That's to the traditional two weeks time. Um, or are we going to wait until the end of the intensive phase of TB treatment? Um, and there are, there's a very specific trial that informs the guideline regarding how soon we start ARVs. It was called the SAPIT study. And it basically divided um, at several arms in the study where it looked at starting ARVs earlier, after intensive phase, or even after um, TB treatment. And in summary, what the study found is that in patients who has pulmonary TB or HIV co-infection with very low CD4 counts, or your very, very sick patients, um, that early ART initiation within about four weeks of TB treatment initiation had better AIDS-free survival. So although there's a much higher risk of iris, especially in these patients with a very low CD4 counts, um, that the survival rate was better, and that if we wait too long with a very low CD4 counts, we have a higher mortality rate. But what they did find is that in patients with CD4 counts over 40, uh, over 50, that by delaying the initiation of ART um, to the first few, few four weeks of the continuation phase, reduces the risk of iris and drug switches, without compromising AIDS-free survival. And so um, the study was really looking at rebalancing these risks and benefits. So by putting people on um, ARVs early, there's a five-fold higher risk of iris. But if they have a very low CD4 count, then the risk of death is higher. You've got a higher CD4 count, there's still an increased risk of iris, um, but waiting with the ARVs has got no no particular risk to your mortality. So it might be worthwhile to wait a little bit and, and get past that um, the time when iris is at the highest risk. And so this study has informed the recommendations we find in our guideline regarding the beginning, the initiation of ARVs. So if the patient has a CD4 count under a 50, we want to start ARVs as soon as possible. And usually we wait about two weeks very sick patients in hospitals, there might even be a decision by a consultant to start earlier. If patients have a CD4 count over 50, though, we can wait, and we can wait as long as till the end of the, as the beginning um, of the continuation phase of TB treatment. Um, and generally, therefore, people wait between four and eight weeks um, to start ARVs. And this reduces the risk of iris as well as drug interaction and toxicities. So to get back to uh, Dinio and our question in the beginning, her CD4 count is 320, and so the art in her with a CD4 over 50 can safely be delayed for as much as eight weeks from the start of TB treatment. There is one other condition I would like to highlight, um, and that is your pregnant woman. So in pregnant women, regardless of the CD4 count, we would start ARVs within two weeks after starting um, the, HIV, the TB treatment. And the biggest reason for that is because we're now wanting to protect the baby and we will therefore um, risk the higher risk of iris to ensure we get her onto ARVs as soon as possible within pregnancy. Um, the other conditions that also requires early ARVs is your patients with an AIDS-defining condition. The only exceptions to this um, with our very sick patients is patients with cryptococcal meningitis or TB meningitis, where we delay the art for at least four to eight weeks because the risk of iris, the iris in those patients have a very high mortality. Now, once you've started a patient on empiric TB treatment, be it for PTB or extrapulmonary TB, it actually becomes the responsibility of the doctor who started the TB treat therapy 
to follow up that patient and to check for response. So one of the challenges in the clinics are that the nurses check the follow-up and the response of the patients by doing um, AFBs. So they will do a baseline AFB on the patient when they start TB treatment, and they will review the AFB at seven weeks, um, and again then at the end of treatment at 23 weeks of TB treatment. But of course, if your patient is gene expert negative and then obviously also AFB negative at the beginning of treatment, how do we monitor those patients? Um, and the biggest thing we're going to use are the symptoms and the picture that we saw at the beginning. And therefore, it's quite important that the same clinician keeps on following up that patient. So what we're looking for in our empiric treatment is we're looking for a dramatic symptomatic improvement within the first two to three weeks. By three weeks, your patient must be a lot, lot better. Um, we don't expect the fever to be going much longer than 10 days. So we expect the fever to be gone and we want to see positive weight gain. If you don't have a clinical response, it might not be TB um, or the patient might have MDR, they might have resistant TB, they might have something like a MAC or a, a CMV uh, uh, pneumonia. So you can't just start the patient on treatment and then discharge the patient to the clinic for follow-up. Some people like to use radiology for follow-up. Radiology is not as reliable. Uh, one can expect to see some resolution of your x-ray picture by about one month. By two months, you definitely want to see an improvement. And it may be normal after the three to six months of TB treatment. But of course, if there's actual damage and fibrosis in the lungs, you might have changes. It's never going to return to normal. Um, and radiology follow-up is not a good way to monitor response to treatment. Your clinical response is much more important. So let's continue with Junio, who is initiated on ART after two weeks in the clinic, um, as there's quite a drive in the clinics to get patients onto to ARVs. Um, and at seven weeks on TB treatment, the clinic nurse takes the AFBs as is required, and it comes back as one plus positive. Um, and she, of course, refers the patient to the doctor, uh, very concerned. And you discover that Edinia had initially felt much better on treatment, but now her cough is worsening. And when you look on the x-ray this time, you actually see there is some hyalur lymphadenopathy. So her clinical picture has worsened from when we initially started her on TB treatment. So why is Edinia getting worse? And let's look at how do we manage the patient who's now at two months on TB treatment and is not improving. By far, the biggest reason why people don't improve is because of adherence. So although we get very worried about resistance in these patients, first make sure your patient has actually been taking their TB treatment. The second, which we will talk about in quite a bit of detail, is iris. So when a patient gets worse on TB treatment, especially after we've started ARVs, it might be part of an iris picture. Then, of course, the next thing we want to worry about is TB drug resistance, and we're definitely going to go and look to see whether she has developed TB drug resistance. It might also be that she doesn't actually have TB at all and that there might be PCP, bacterial pneumonia or other viral infections that's causing the trouble. Um, MAC is also an important differential here. It might also be that there's other things that's causing poor absorption of the TB drugs or that she's been taking or prescribed an incorrect dose of TB drugs, especially if she's perhaps picked up considerable amount of weight early on in treatment. So to be able to assess a patient at two months who is AFB positive, it's important firstly to take a good history, find out about adherence, find out about MDR contacts, find out about reasons why she might not be absorbing her treatment. So those common reasons why the AFBs might still be positive. And obviously investigate again. So examine her again, evaluate the severity. It might be something completely different that we are actually seeing at the moment. We're still going to use our antibiotics again. It might be a super infection at this point. And now we're going to send off some investigations. If there's a, um, if she has sputum production, it's very useful to send for an MCNS. But very important, as part of your approach of an AFB positive patient at seven weeks, we are now going to do a line probe assay. You can only do line probe assays um, if patients are AFB positive, And this is the, the perfect indication for it. And your line probe assay is going to confirm on whether she has rifampicin um, and or INH resistance um, to TB. Um, continue with your initiation treatment for one more month. That's also in our guideline. 
and we're going to watch her carefully. So we, if she's stable, we're going to review in five days to see if she's getting better maybe or if she's getting worse on the antibiotics. And your LPA results are going to be back really quickly and um, within a week or as much as two weeks. If it is an iris, so this is a patient who's been taking a treatment but is now getting worse, your LPA will be negative or it will show an INH and rifampicin sensitive mycobacterium. So we're expecting that the treatment is working, um, but she has an overreaction of her immune system. If she gets diagnosed with INH or RIF resistance on the LPA, then we're going to manage as is appropriate. So your RIF resistance is you're going to refer to your MDR-TB units, and they'll be started on MDR-TB treatment if she's got RIF and INH resistance. Um, but she might have INH mono resistance, and those need to be discussed and needs further investigations. A lot of them can be simply be managed with a six months of the four drugs, but do discuss with an expert um, for your particular case. But I do want to say for a few words about iris because we sometimes forget about iris in patients who worsen clinically after initiating on ARBs. So most of us are very aware of um, iris as an unmasking phenomenon. So your patient's completely well, you start them on ARBs, and now they develop TB or now they develop cryptococcus. But we certainly can see iris in patients where you've started the patient on TB treatment and now their TB symptoms are getting worse. And we often think it is resistance where actually it is an iris. You can also get iris on somebody who's only on TB treatment and is not yet on ARVs. So maybe you've got somebody where you're waiting for your ARVs, you put them on TB treatment and they seem to be getting worse. Um, and what is actually happening is as the TB treatment is treating the bacilli, your CD4 count is also recovering um, and you can actually have an iris-like phenomenon. And this iris that gets worse once you've started somebody on treatment, we call paradoxical TB iris. So somebody who's got new TB symptoms or the TB symptoms they've had is getting worse. So Indenio is a good example. She was AFB negative at the beginning, and now suddenly she's AFB positive. Um, her x-ray was normal in the beginning, and now suddenly she has a positive um, picture on x-ray. And paradoxical TB iris is, is actually remarkably common. In some studies, it's as much as 54% of patients will get slightly worse before they get better, especially once you've started them on ARVs. And it's quick, quick after starting the ARVs, the median there being 14 days where you will start seeing a paradoxical iris picture. Um, and it can include a whole range of different things, be it increased fever, tachycardia, and um, weight loss being a very key picture. A lot of hospitalization as a result, um, and the iris can go on for a while. So it's not that they're going to, it takes a while for the TB treatment to then outweigh this um, inflammatory picture that we are seeing. But very important with iris is that mortality is infrequent, and most of our patients do very well. If we simply continue them on the TB treatment, give them supportive treatment, um, they actually do very well. And this is the reason why we don't stop ARVs in patients who have iris. Remember, all that iris means is that your own body is also now making inflammation. It's actually helping the ARVs to, to um, fight the infection, although it's a little bit of an overreaction. Um, and therefore, it's very important that we continue both the TB treatment as well as the ARVs, and these patients generally do very well. This is a picture of worsening pulmonary infiltrates and even cavitation due to TB iris. Another TB manifestation that loves to iris is your TB lymph and adenitis. So you have a patient with a TB lymph gland, you start them on ARVs, and the gland starts becoming more um, inflamed and might even separate. It's in cases like these where steroids might have a place. And whenever you're considering using steroids and iris, it's always worthwhile discussing these patients. Um, but patients with a lymph gland that is worsening on ARVs and TB treatment respond very well to one to two milligrams of prednisone a day over a two to four week period. And that quite often prevents the gland from actually starting um, to cause sinuses, sinus formation, et cetera, and is worthwhile considering. This is just a slide to show what a wide range of iris conditions have been described and almost every single OI a patient can get can also potentially iris. So which art can we use in combination with our TB treatment? 
So as you can see with this table, we can fortunately use uh, most of our ARVs quite safely. The only exception is nevirapine due to hepatotoxicity um, and streptomycin, amikacin, canamycin, we can't use without tenofovir. So for DINEO, we're going to use our nice fixed dose combination, easy to take, um, no real interactions. Nevirapine luckily is not an issue with her. We don't want to use it because of hepatotoxicity. If you are considering D4T for some reason, um, watch out with the INH. Peripheral neuropathy could be an issue. But very importantly, in our MDR TB patients, we have to avoid our tenofovir and canamycin combinations. And we quite often use a bacavir in these patients um, just throughout the intensive phase of the MDR TB treatment. So Dinho now tells you that she sometimes works night shifts at the restaurant. She also tells you that she's really interested in having a baby before she turns 30. Um, and we need to keep all of these things in consideration when we prescribe our, our treatment. So night shifts, you can use either nevirapine or Alluvia if it's a TB patient. For patients who are doing night shifts, if you are concerned about efavirenz, um, causing either drowsiness or dizziness. This is also important for your patients who are driving heavy machinery. Um, very important, though, is that for most patients, the efavirenz side effects do settle down in the first four to six weeks. And all the issues with nevirapine, especially around it being a twice-a-day dosing, might make it worthwhile, if possible, to either use um, sick leave or to support the patient during that first four to six weeks on efavirenz and see if we can manage for the patient to eventually be on an efavirenz-based regimen, which you can actually even take in the mornings once the symptoms have settled. With fertility, um, in the old days, this would have been an issue if somebody was going to fall pregnant. Important to note, we no longer use nevirapine routinely in our fertile women, but evidence is safe to use in fertile women as well as in pregnant women. And if she's on TB treatment, again, to reiterate, we cannot use nevirapine if Farron's is going to be our first choice. And you therefore have to discuss with your patients with all these other issues to weigh up the risks and benefits. But we also need to think about contraception and helping Dinio to actually time her, um, her family and to look at other possible drug interactions. So firstly, um, injectable contraceptives is probably still one of our best options apart from the IUCD with your TB treatment. With rifampicin, it's now being confirmed that there's no need to reduce the interval between injections and they can just stay on their normal Depo-Provera or Neristrate. Oral contraceptives, though, are not such a great option with rifampicin. You have to use really good dosages um, of ethanol estradiol and it's unreliable, so we tend to avoid those during TB treatment. Just a reminder that if you do use rifampicin and alluvia, so in patients on second line or patients who can't tolerate efavirenz, you have to double the dose of the alluvia over two weeks um, until two weeks after the TB treatment is completed because the rifampicin massively reduces the dose of the lupinavir and it needs ritonavir boosting. In children, we would boost with ritonavir, but an adult's double dosing of alluvia can be adequate if you don't have access to extra ritonavir. And then some drugs, if your patient is on other medication like antiepileptics, um, warfarin specifically, and oral hypoglycemics, you might need to just keep a very close eye um, to see what drug interactions um, might have an effect, for example, on their INR levels or on their blood glucose levels. So in summary, we want to get all of our patients with TB treatment onto ARVs, but we have to weigh up the risks of iris with early treatment and the risk of disease progression with later initiation. Thank you very much uh, to WITS RHI for the slide and the ERASA 3i toolkits for some of the illustrations.